It was another news-packed week in Washington as President Trump dealt with outcry over his comments to a Gold Star family and the public statements of his presidential predecessors. It's time for the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That's syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Uh, Mark, let's start with this controversy that sprung from really a tragedy of four soldiers in Niger. And then we have the president, the chief of staff, a widow, and a congressman all involved in this. Well, first, the reason we have it is the president, uh, whatever he's on the defensive or can't ask, answer a question, his default position is to attack. Uh, and to criticize. In this case, he criticized his predecessors for the fact that in 12 days there had been no communication, no statement from the White House on the four fallen Americans in Nigeria, what their, what their mission was, uh, how, how it happened. Um, and uh, he, he they so tried to absolve himself by attacking unfairly and inaccurately uh, President Obama and uh, President Bush. Um, and it became so bad, the political bleeding, that uh, they felt it necessary to bring out uh, General John Kelly, the chief of staff, the president. General Kelly is a four-star Marine general uh, who served himself, whose uh, son Robert was killed in combat in Afghanistan, a Marine lieutenant, and whom, about whom he asks people not to talk, not to speak. Um, when he's introduced, he prefers not that not be mentioned. Um, and uh, it became uh, his chief of staff obligations, obviously, uh, superseded. And he, he stepped in uh, to stop the bleeding for, for Donald Trump. He spoke eloquently, spoke movingly, spoke with personal experience and conviction. Um, and then he went too far. Um, he went on an ad hominem or ad feminine attack upon uh, Congressman Wilson uh, of, uh, of Florida, which was inaccurate. Um, he said that these are private communications, uh, probably the third most uh, quoted writing of Abraham Lincoln is his, write, his letter to Mrs. Bixby, the mother of five sons who were killed in uh, the Civil War. Um, so, um, you know, he, he, he defended. He, he, he was on the high ground. He's got a, a marvelous record, uh, but uh, now he's, he's in the mix. He's now the chief of staff, and he's mixing it up. Yeah, I've been mean, reminded of what Karl Marx right that all historical events happen twice. First is tragedy, and next is farce. And so we had the four, four soldiers killed. That was the tragedy. Mm -hmm. And then Trump made the call, and one imagines he made the call and repeated in clumsy form what John Kelly said, mm -hmm. that the soldier died doing what he loved to do with his best and with the best among them, that he chose to be among the 1 percent, the best among us. And, you know, Donald Trump is not Oprah. He doesn't do empathy particularly well, and I'm sure it was clumsy. Uh, and so that happened. And then it off, it's off to the circus. And so then we get a political charge against Trump, and then Trump lies and says something about Obama, and then it's just back and forth. And uh, it's, these, are, it, these are like the typical pseudo events of the Trump era, where it's really about nothing except we want to have a fight with each other. And so they're going to have a fight over something, uh, and nobody, in, to my mind, comes out looking particularly well. You know, uh, Senator McCain, earlier this week, when receiving uh, an award, I think, at the National Cons Constitution Center in Philadelphia, he, um, I want to get his quote right, he spoke out against, quote, half-baked spurious nationalism. But what was interesting was later in the week, just yesterday, we had both presidents before Trump, um, uh, Mr. Bush and Mr. Obama, in separate speeches, uh, come out and make statements. They didn't call Trump out by name, but let's take a listen to what they said. Instead of our politics reflecting our values, We've got politics infecting our communities. Instead of looking for ways to work together and get things done in a practical way, we, we've got folks who are deliberately trying to make folks angry, to demonize people who have different ideas. Bigotry seems emboldened. Our politics seems more vulnerable to conspiracy theories and outright fabrication. We've seen nationalism distorted into nativism. We've forgotten the dynamism that immigration has always brought to America. Mark? 
Yeah, I mean, it, 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 uh, there's no question whom they're talking about. I mean, that, that, they don't have to say Donald Trump's name uh, in all three cases. Um, and uh, uh, John, John McCain, um, George W. Bush had been quite circumspect, quite uh, silent during the eight years of Barack Obama. Even if we call during the debate in South Carolina in 2016, when he accused George W. Bush of knowing that there were no weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq, and yet sending Americans into combat and some uh, to death. Um, and, and, but McCain, you know, that McCain, I think, speaks from a position that uh, is unassailable. Um, I mean, this is a man that uh, Trump said he's not a hero. Uh, he was he spent five and a half years as a prisoner of war being tortured every day. Uh, and uh, he's not, and he's, the rest of his life has been devoted to public service. Uh, he hasn't closed any big real estate deals, so he doesn't uh, qualify. Um, but I, I, I thought, uh, I think that it's it, the, the Challenge has been laid down. I mean, Jeff Flake has picked it up. Bob Cork has picked it up. Um, to some degree, Ben Sass has. But uh, what, what are the other Republicans going to do? I mean, they're just going to remain silent. Yeah, and you know, Steve Bannon has a theory about world history, and that the, among them, that the post world, post World War II international order was a mistake, and we should get rid of it. And Donald Trump sort of has that theory. And no one's made the case for what was a bipartisan consensus in favor of that order mm -hmm. and in favor of a certain story of America, that we're a country of immigrants, that we're a country of the future, that we're not a country of blood and soil. And so Bannon and Trump have had the intellectual feel to themselves, at least as far as elected officials have gone. Uh, and it's true that neither Obama, Bush, or probably McCain are ever going to run for office again. But at least they're making the case. At least the counterargument is beginning to be made. And I think what's occurring to a lot of people is that first, we're in a 50-year debate about what the 21st century, well, maybe an 83-year debate about what the 21st century is going to look like. And it's probably going to debate between some form of populism and some form of openness and diversity. And so it's occurring to people that they have to get involved in that debate. And second, uh, there, I think as Steve Bannon has gone to pick off other Republicans, it's become clear to a lot of people in the Republican Party, there's no escaping this debate, that you can't hide and hope you'll get ignored and that Bannon will pass you over. Even in Wyoming. They're, they're, even in Wyoming, <laughs> yeah. they're coming yeah. after you. Yeah. And so you, you might as well take a side. Uh, and, and so I think we're finally beginning to see that some two-sided debate uh, out of this. All right, let's talk a little bit about health care. There was bit of confusion on that front, too, on where the White House stood, where the legislative agenda stood. Um, two senators, uh, Senator Alexander and Senator Murray, have been working together, reached what in other Congresses would be something pretty normal, a bipartisan approach to this. Yet there's still a lot of tension on whether this is going to move forward or not. Yeah, no, and I, I think the, the jury's very much out. But I mean, both parties—it's—it's it's what legislating used to be about. Both you give up something uh, in hopes of getting something. The, the Democrats see this as a, a way of, uh, of sustaining and uh, and strengthening uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Republicans uh, realize that they can't go into 2018 just having eliminated health care for 18 or 20 million Americans. Uh, so th 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 if they have any hope of ever block granting it or sending it uh, in some form of repeal, replace, uh, I, I think there is. But the president was for it before he was against it. Uh, and then he was for Lamar Alexander, uh, the Republican senator from Tennessee, and Patty Murray, the Democratic senator from Washington, who were the grown-ups in the room, who actually legislated. At this point, with 12 Republicans, I mean, that's the 60 votes you need to get it through the Senate, right? Through the Senate, yeah, it looks that way. If you've got 12 Republicans and 12 Democratic co-sponsors, it looks pretty good in the Senate. And as Mark said, it's just an outbreak of normalcy. It's in nobody's interest for the insurance markets to crater. No. Uh, and so you had some people responding to a genuine problem. Whether it can get through the House is another question. I think the senators are realistic about that. Uh, Paul Ryan has not been super enthusiastic about it, uh, but I think they'll defer to the White House, and we'll see where the White House, as Mark said, changes their minds. But at least you're beginning to see people behave like senators. And if you can get 12 and 12 co-sponsors on this, why can't they do some other things? Why can't they begin to actually get some legislation, at least in the Senate, uh, and put the, the House on the defensive for, for a little while? Senator McConnell has yet to take a position. Yeah, bravely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Paul Ryan was at the uh, Al Smith dinner last night, one of the few times of the year that people seem to put down their swords, walk into a, a place to raise some funds. Uh, let's take a listen to a couple of the, okay. the jokes that he had here. And when you read the papers tomorrow, everyone's going to report this thing differently. 
Breitbart's going to lead with, Ryan slams the president amongst liberal elites. New York Times is going to report, Ryan defends the president in a state Hillary won. And the president will tweet, 300,000 at Al Smith dinner cheer mention of my name. <laughs> You know, the reason jokes are often funnier is there's some truth to them, right? I mean, and there are several other very good one-liners we didn't have the videotape of, but um, he, how much of this is, you know, stuff that has to sort of be cleared by the White House? How much of this is a, a pressure release and opportunity for Paul Ryan to say the things that otherwise he doesn't say? Well, I mean, it, it, it was a side of Paul Ryan that has been kept, I'd say, out of the public eye. Um, David could tell us whether that's what Republicans wear when they're alone in private, that, that white tie <laughs> deal. Um, but uh, probably, it, it, it's good It's good to laugh. He, he showed an ability to laugh both at himself as, as well as the, the, the president. Uh, and as they said, he wakes up every morning. First thing he does is uh, twirl through his... Uh, uh, t tweets uh, to see which, which one of the president's uh, tweets he's going to have to deny that he read that day. I mean, so he, he, he did show a certain awareness. And I, I think humor, whatever you say about this administration, it is humor free. I mean, self deprecating humor and Donald Trump are mutually exclusive. Republicans wear riding jackets today. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was a Catholic dinner, so I thought it was. It was yeah. You go to dinner. It was, a, it, was, it, was a, <laughs> it was a Catholic dinner for Al Smith, the first time yeah. Catholic nominee, and we've elected a lot of Catholics since then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> John Kennedy, and then John Kennedy, and then Jack Kennedy. Yeah. It's an, it's always a great dinner. Uh, not that I've been, but I watch on C-SPAN. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but it's always funny, with one exception. And that was not Donald Trump last year. That's exactly right. He, he turned it into what usually is quite a funny dinner into uh, just a bitter diatribe. <laughs> and, and that, you know, you can tell a lot about a person by whether they laugh, uh, how they laugh, and what they tell their jokes about. Yeah. And Paul Ryan's a genuinely, he's a good guy. Uh, he's stuck in a miserable uh, circumstance, but he's a good guy, and he can be quite funny. All right. David Brooks, Mark Shields. Thank you. Both funny men. Thank you. <laughs>